Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Scott Leland. I'm the executive director of the Mosavar Romani Center for Business and Government, which is hosting today's event. Uh, we're very happy to have Ignacio Angeloni here to uh, be our main speaker. He's going to be talking on the financial factors in regional poverty and inequality. Before I uh, say a few brief words of introduction, I'd like to uh, remind people to please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen in order to submit questions. And uh, we'll be addressing those uh, after Ignacio Angeloni has gone through his initial presentation. Ignacio Angeloni has a PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania. His thesis was actually on economics and econometrics. He has worked in, in Italy's Ministry of Economy and Finance as the Director for International Financial Affairs. He's been the Deputy Governor for Italy and the World Bank and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and the Asian Development Bank and the African Development Bank. In uh, 2014, he was appointed a member of the uh, European uh, Central Bank Supervisory Board with a five-year mandate. He's held teaching positions at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, in various other institutions. He's published uh, books and articles in top US and European academic referee journals. He's served at the uh, most of our Romani Center for Business and Government as a senior fellow. And he's currently a research fellow uh, as he continues his research at our center. We're delighted to have uh, and welcome back to the podium, Ignacio Angeloni. Uh, thank you very much, and it's over to you. Many thanks, Scott, for this introduction. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon if you are in Europe, like myself. And thanks a lot for attending. Uh, as Scott uh, mentioned, we are presenting results, preliminary results, from a research project uh, that has been ongoing uh, for a while on uh, financial factors in regional poverty and inequality in the United States. You can see the authors there is, uh, in addition to myself, is Chanta Vitantazit, who is a PhD candidate at Oxford, and Johannes Kasinger, who is a PhD candidate at Goethe University, Frankfurt. Before I start, let me mention that we are very grateful to the FDIC's uh, economics department, uh, and in particular to Eric Breisenstein, who I think is with us uh, today, for their uh, very helpful support in using their, in using their data. So let, uh, the starting point, at least for me, the starting point of this project was when I read this paper that you see there. It's a paper by Austin Glazer and Summers. Uh, it's a 2018 Brookings paper. The title is Jobs for the Heartland, Place-Based Policies for 21st Century America. And in that paper, which is a very interesting one, I recommend everybody to read it, they made essentially three points. First, they show very interesting evidence on the growing divergence, spatial divergence, uh, divergence uh, in the US uh, uh, economy and the US economic performance uh, in different regions. Second, uh, they suggest that this is a case for having uh, space-based policies. Space-based policies means uh, policies based on location and not based on people. This is something that the US doesn't have uh, historically. Europe has space-based politics, uh, but uh, the US traditionally has not, has, uh, uh, has not used uh, these policies. The argument is based on spatial externalities, the idea that uh, within a certain region, uh, there may be externalities which do not go beyond the region and do not depend on interaction among people, but on people being in that particular location. Finally, they make some suggestions on what these policies can be. And they, they mention in particular employment subsidies, job counseling, and education. Now, one of the things that struck me about this paper and also the rest of the literature, which is quite large now, the literature on poverty and unemployment and uh, inequality in the US, is that financial factors are not considered at all. Uh, yet, uh, uh, there are several strands of literature uh, that uh, suggest that finance is an important determinant, a co-determinant of economic growth and economic performance. 
Think, for example, about the finance and growth literature, summarized, for example, by an article by Ledin in the 2005 Handbook of Economic Growth, or there is also evidence that uh, 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 financial development uh, um, uh, affects inequality, actually reduces inequality and poverty. There's an article by Demijur Kunt and Levine in the NBRR working paper 2009. And there is also a, a different literature, which is uh, usually referred mainly to monetary transmission analysis, which suggests that banks uh, establish lending relationship with their clients and by establishing those lending relationships they help the borrowers they shelter borrowers from from shocks so the general implications of this literature you can read in the bottom of this slide is basically first of all financial development increases growth and reduces poverty and inequality this is not a unanimous conclusion but it's the prevalent uh, bottom line that emerges from this literature so financial development is helpful. Uh, small banks tend to establish lending relationship, closer lending relationship with, uh, with their uh, borrowers, in particular firms. It protects them from adverse shocks and therefore uh, promotes sustainable economic growth. And also there is evidence that banks that have a stronger balance sheet, by stronger balance sheet, I mean uh, they are better capitalized, they are more liquid, they have less non-performing loans, et cetera, lower cost, more efficient, et cetera. Those banks, those stronger banks are able to perform this function better. And so they are more beneficial to the, uh, econo the economy that they serve. So can we put these two literature together? Let me mention that there are in addition to these interesting analytical issues, there are also major political agendas behind this. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the uh, support in the US for regulatory relief for community banks, which I think has already produced a number of uh, um, legislative initiatives in the last few years, uh, supported in a bipartisan way uh, towards relieving the uh, regulatory burden for community banks precisely based on the idea that these banks are more helpful for the local communities. And in Europe, we have something very similar. There is a small banking box agenda uh, in Germany. And in Italy, there's a lot of political support for lighter regulation for cooperative banking sector. The cooperative banking sector in Italy is composed by a myriad of very small banks that are very deeply rooted in the local community and they have close ties with the firm. So this is also a political issue. So we focus on four questions. First of all, there's a general question, which is, is there a link between banking conditions? When I say banking condition, I mean both the structure of the banking population and also the performance, structure and performance between banking condition and economic condition, particular poverty and inequality at the local level. Is there a relation, uh, regardless of whether the, the, the causation goes in one direction or the other? Now, of course, however, more specifically, we are interested in looking at causality. We're interested to see if banks affect, in a causal sense, uh, the economic performance locally. Uh, we are also interested in seeing whether the performance of banks uh, or the structure of the banking sector, and we will see exactly what I mean by structure, uh, affect uh, local economic conditions in a different way, in a particular way. And also, in particular, whether the uh, banking population structure intending the presence of community banks, there's a thing that is particularly interesting in the US case, whether the presence of community banks is helpful uh, from this point of view. So this is the US map, as you can recognize, there are 50 states, there are 3,000 plus counties. Counties are very different uh, in terms of uh, size in particular. Uh, as you can see, the Western counties are bigger on average than the Eastern counties. And they are also very different, and that's the point in terms of their economic performance. And there is a lot of disparity, a lot of divergence even within states. 
is a fascinating book by Moretti uh, of Berkeley. It's, it's titled The New Geography of Jobs, which shows that even in very rich states, for example, like California, or very, very close, for example, to the Silicon Valley, which is probably one of the richest places on earth, uh, a few miles away, there are deep pockets of poverty. Uh, why do I say that? Uh, uh, I say that because uh, um, uh, uh, doing an analysis like the one we want to do uh, using only state data is not adequate because the real diversity very often is within states. So we need to go uh, more detailed and more disaggregated. The natural choice is the county level analysis. As I said, there are 3,142, according to my latest counting, counties in the, in the United States. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, uh, a natural way also because the economic and social statistics are available at the county level. Uh, this is a natural type of disaggregation. The problem in doing that is that the banking data at county level do not exist. So we looked around uh, and we um, thought that we should construct this data. And what exists in particular are very detailed um, databases maintained by the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And there are in particular two very important databases that we used, one is uh, at the level of banks, a very uh, large number of detailed indicators at bank level. So not geographically disaggregated, but at the level of banks. Then there is another database on deposits only, only on deposits, annual data. The balance sheet indicators are quarterly. Deposits are annual data, which include the deposit location at the level of each branch. So using the information, the deposit location at the branch level and using, of course, the information of the location of the branch, one is able to reconstruct the uh, amounts of deposit held um, in each uh, county. And our strategy uh, after that, our strategy is to use the deposit location to estimate the balance sheet indicators at the county level. Now, this is an estimate, these are not real data. So there are caveats there. Uh, the critical assumption that we make, that we have to make, is that the deposit location is a good proxy for bank asset allocation. Uh, there are a few papers that consider this problem. One is by Avery, 2004, and they use a more or less the similar methodology. So they use the deposit location as an indicator. There is also a robustness analysis, which was done by the Philadelphia Fed in 2018 paper, in which they show that there is a reasonably good correspondence for at least part of the banks. They, they do a pilot study. They don't have the, the full data on assets, but on the pilot study on cert certain categories of loans, they find a good correspondence between the location of deposits and assets. But, uh, um, as I said, this is, this is a hypothesis and it's an approximation, but there is, is the best way one can do it because there's no other way to estimate, given the present state of the statistic, to estimate the uh, asset location uh, at, the county, at the county level. So this is what we do. We have a methodology here. I don't want to go through the details of this, but basically we have to do it in two steps. First, using the deposit, we allocate the assets. So the total size of the balance sheet of each bank. And the second step, we use the estimated assets to uh, break down a number of indicators like efficiency, non-performing loans, return on assets, etc. You will see it. Why do we need two steps instead of using deposits directly? Well, the reason is simple because uh, banks have very different deposit asset ratios. Some banks fund themselves fully with deposits. Other banks uh, fund themselves in different ways. So when we calculate the level of individual counties, the weighted average in order to calculate the indicators, we want to use the total size of the balance sheet and not uh, the uh, deposit only because that would be misleading. So the deposit asset ratio we want to net out. And that's why we use the second step, the estimated assets totals. 
So what we have done so far, uh, we have calculated um, about 25 indicators for six years. The six years are 2000, 2005, 2010, 2018, 19, and 20. Now, these years are not chosen at random. Uh, the last one, 2020, is the last one available, and it's particularly interesting because it's a post-COVID year. We have not analyzed that yet. We do have the data, but we have not analyzed that yet. What we're going to show in this seminar is 19. 19 is the last pre-COVID uh, year, uh, you know, and it's also, I think, a very indicative year. The performance of the economy was very good, et cetera, et cetera. But it's the latest pre-COVID year uh, that we uh, can, can have. Then we have 18. Then we have 10. 10 is an interesting year because it's a post-great financial crisis year. So as you will see, the big unemployment levels, et cetera. So it's, it's a particular year. So it's the, the, maybe the, the, the first uh, uh, year in which the uh, great financial crisis is fully manifest, uh, 2010. Uh, 2005 is a pre-crisis year, and 2000 is the beginning of the decade, so uh, the, the century, so to speak. So, so we have these six years, for example, uh, as an example, and we show today. Uh, we will show here uh, some descriptive charts for 19, and uh, some preliminary panel estimates using all six years that you will see. Now, our follow-up is, first of all, to complete the time dimension, so to estimate every year from 2000 to today, and to do full panel analysis, dynamic panels with all the controls, etc., and to work on exogeneities. As you will see, we can make a quite strong statement about uh, correspondence of certain relationships, but we can make no statements about causality yet. And then, of course, we're very interested in the last point to see what, uh, what 2020 has to tell us in terms of the effects of COVID on all the variables that we consider. So here you see, uh, here you see some descriptive variables, uh, descriptive statistics for all the indicators that we have. And they're quite interesting numbers, I have to say. I don't have time to go through uh, all of them, but let me just mention uh, the first few lines. So the first, the first line, for example, the first line is the number of banks in operation. This tells you how many banks operate in each county. The minimum, as you would expect, is one. The, uh, the maximum, as we learned from the last column, is 104. So the county that has the largest number of banks operating is 104. The second, the mean is 8.2, so 8.2% on average. Now, the second line tells us the number of counties uh, in which each bank operates. So that sounds the same as the first, but it's different. The population is the banks now, and in how many counties they actually operate. So the minimum is, again, one, as you would expect, but what we learn is that the maximum number of counties in which a U.S. bank operates is 870. It's quite large, you know, uh, 870 uh, uh, out of uh, 3,000 plus, as we, as we have seen. Um, then we, if we look a little bit below, uh, for example, the fourth line, the fourth line is the share of community banks assets. So the market share of community banks in each county. So the mean market share is 55%, 55.8%. It's quite high. Uh, the, uh, what you can see there is distribution is quite regular. So the 25th percentile is 23.5. The P50, which is the median, is 58.5, etc. And of course, the, the maximum, as one would also expect, is 100%. In some counties, there are only community banks. Just below that, we have calculated the share of the top five US banks. So the, the, the big mega banks, you have them in the footnote at JP Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, and US Bancorp. So the market share of these five. Uh, what is interesting in that line, you see the minimum is zero, but also 
the 25th percentile and the, the, the median, uh, the, 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 um, the P50 percentile is also zero. So that means that there's a very large number of counties in which those big five are completely absent. So this distribution is very skewed to the right. Uh, I did expect that to some extent, but not to this extent, I have to say. So that means that uh, there is a large part of the territory of the United States in which those big giant banks don't count at all. And we have to look at the much smaller uh, bank population, including the particular the community banks, to understand how the banks affect the economy. This is an interesting table, but I don't have time to go through. I, I want to show now a few, a few uh, descriptive charts. So this is bank intensity. This is the statistic that we just saw, the number of banks per county. And we have in each of the charts that I'm going to show now, you have on the left-hand side, you have a, a, color, a color chart showing the, the intensity of the color shows the of course the level of the particular indicator in this one so the darker means uh, that there are more banks in the particular county on the right hand side we have the histograms the distribution how they are distributed and we compare the distribution in 2019 this is the gray the gray histogram <coughs> with the distribution in 2005 so we can have a sense of how the, uh, the pattern has changed during the course of the last uh, 15, 20 years or so. So first of all, you see the distribution has not changed much uh, at all in the, last, uh, in the last 15, 20 years. You see, distribution is more or less the same. This is the, it's a crude indicator of the degree of, competi of local competition. So the number of banks operating. Uh, the other thing that you see uh, in the uh, chart uh, is, uh, you see, there is, a, there is a region in the middle, uh, which ranges from the Midwest North to the Midwest South, which is rather white. So that means that in that, that region, uh, there tend to be only very few banks uh, operating. Uh, conversely, on the West and West Coast and uh, East Coast and Florida in particular, as you can see, those are the areas where we have uh, uh, much more competition, quote unquote, much higher number of banks operating in the same, in the same territory. Uh, if you look, uh, this is the uh, bank, uh, bank intensity measured in a different way. So these are bank assets divided by GDP. Surprisingly, this is, tends to be the opposite. So you see the central area is the one in which the ratio between bank assets and GDP is higher. Um, so that means perhaps because the GDP is lower. I don't know uh, what the reason is there. It's just, uh, just an impression, but it's clear that the central areas in the United States are the ones in which the ratio of bank assets to GDP tend to be higher. And conversely, for example, look at the West Coast. Uh, uh, that's where uh, the ratio tend to be tend to be very uh, tend to be very small. Um, we will see some results on that. Um, on the right hand side, you see the distribution. Distribution has moved to the left uh, between 2005 and 2019. Has moved to the left. That means that. Uh, the bank intensity per GDP, per unit of GDP, so to speak, has gone down uh, in, the last, uh, in the last 15 years. This is one of the things we are really interested in. So this is the market share of community banks. So the pres this measures the presence of community banks in the US territory. Again, we see a, an area in the middle, uh, quite intensive, of dark color. Dark color means that community banks in those areas are very important. Uh, they are very important. Uh, conversely, in the West, uh, uh, the color is predominantly white. And uh, uh, also in certain areas of the East, not the New England, for example, uh, 
uh, not certain parts of the south, but the rest of the eastern shore, so to speak, of the US, uh, the presence of community banks is a little bit weaker. Uh, it's, used, it's interesting to look at the uh, picture on the right hand side too. First of all, the presence of community banks is quite stable. You see the, the chart for 2005 and the one for 19 are rather similar. Uh, what has happened is that uh, the spike at the extreme left has gone up. So that these are these are counties in which the presence of community bank is zero, so it's it's absent, uh, and that has happened at the expense of um, counties where previously uh, the market share was in the order of 40, 50, 60 percent. You see the the histograms in the middle. So there seems to be. I mean, the population of community banks as a whole has gone down, is going down, is trending down in the US. And this has happened in particular for those um, areas where the market share was in the order of 40, 50, and uh, with an increase of areas where uh, the community banks are completely absent. Now, there's also a big histogram on the right hand side, uh, as you can see, which has not changed much. And that histogram tells us that there are many counties where community banks are the only banks and you know that reinforces what, uh, what we saw at the beginning in the in the statistics this is the uh, big five so the, the big five uh, the assets of the big five banks uh, as a ratio of total bank assets it's a little bit the mirror image of the preceding one they are particularly strong in the west uh, as you can see, the West Coast in particular, they are not strong in the center and in the Southeast. They tend to be strong again in certain areas of the Midwest, the New York State, etc., and Florida. So this is a little bit uh, that reinforces the idea that there is a certain complementarity or, or a certain substitution between the role of uh, community banks and the role of larger banks in different parts of the U.S. territory. This is the leverage ratio. Uh, so the leverage ratio, but this is measured in uh, the opposite way that you normally consider. So this is the higher number and the darker the color means more capital per unit of assets, not the other way around. So the, where the, where the uh, color is darker, the banks are less leveraged, not more. So you see that uh, in the central part uh, uh, and to some extent also in the south uh, east part, uh, we tend to have darker colors, which means uh, more capital, safer banks from the point of view of capitalization. And the opposite happened in the west. So west, uh, you know, if you measure by capital, you would say that uh, in the west there are more risky banks less capital per unit of assets, uh, and in the center and the southwest, it's uh, relatively safer. As you can see in the histogram, the chart has moved to the right. So the capitalization of banks in general is higher now. This is, of course, a result of the crisis and the post-crisis reform. In general, the banking sector is more capitalized now than it used to be before the great financial crisis. And here you have profitability measured by the return on asset. Now, what is interesting here, this is a little bit, again, the mirror image of the preceding one. At the center, you tend to have lots of whites. Uh, so low return. We had seen before that the banks were relatively safer. So you have uh, safer banks, uh, less risk, uh, uh, correspond to less return, as you would expect. Uh, whereas on the west side, for example, of the country, you have higher return on assets and lower uh, capitalization. So more risky banks uh, earn a higher return. This is what, uh, you know, uh, theory or common sense economics uh, would suggest. Uh, we can see on the right hand side that the, uh, that the uh, profitability has gone down. Uh, the distribution has moved to the left. This is a result not only of the fact that banks tend to be safer, but also the lower level of interest rates and lower level of margins, which is a big component of the 
of the returns of the bank, the interest rate margins. Actually, we have here the interest rate margin is more or less tells the same story as the preceding chart. This is the non-performing loans ratio. Uh, this is, uh, I find, uh, quite a bit spotty. I mean, the, there's no story to tell here. I mean, the, the big there's big differentiation, big differences, lots of whites and lots of dark green, but there's no not much of a of a pattern, I would say, with the exception perhaps of the West Coast, where it's mainly white, so low non-performing loans. Uh, the histogram to the right is moved a little bit to the right, so we have more non-performing loans now. Uh, I thought that was kind of surprising myself because the 2019 was, as I said, a very good year for the US economy. It was the the final year of a very long stretch of uh, good years uh, from the point of view of growth. So I was surprised to see that, uh, but still, uh, maybe it's still uh, maybe it's still a little bit of a legacy of the of the crisis, which remained even after a passage of a number of years. Uh, okay, now this is now we move to the economic performance, and we have lots of indicators. I'm going to show only three. The first is unemployment rate. So this tells you the unemployment rate in the different counties of the US economy. Sharp differences, as you can see. And we find, again, a big area in the middle <coughs> of low unemployment. Low unemployment. So both in the north part of the Midwest and in the south part of the Midwest, uh, Texas, etc. Conversely, the unemployment rate is higher in many areas of the West uh, part of the United States. In the South uh, East uh, Gulf of Mexico, there are very dark areas there. And the part of the part of the East, if one excludes uh, the coast and the uh, and uh, New England, etc. But I, what I found uh, quite interesting and striking about this chart is the visual correspondence that you can see between the unemployment rate and uh, I'm moving back now. I'm going to the community banks. You see, these are the community, the intensity of community banks, uh, and this is the unemployment rate. You see? So if one were to sort of do a broad brush judgment based on only on these two charts, uh, one would be tempted to say that where the community banks are present, the unemployment is lower. And this is a little bit, it's, it's, it's a little bit, it echoes some of those arguments that uh, we often hear made and uh, that I think to some extent drive the political agendas that I mentioned before that uh, community banks or small banks in general, this is a story not only for the US, but it's a story which is very popular in Europe as well, that uh, small local banks uh, uh, protect the economy better than large, than large banks. So these two charts, if one were to look only these two charts and nothing else, no, that would be supportive of that. Uh, we will see in a minute that that is not the case. Uh, this is the poverty rate. Poverty rate is the percentage of people below the poverty as a total uh, ratio of total population. This po poverty is very large, uh, as you can see. Eh? So if you see the distribution on the right, the mode is above 10%. So above 10% of the population is below the poverty line. So we're talking about uh, 40 million people or so. Uh, and uh, geographically, uh, it's, a, it's less clear. I mean, you have this uh, central area, but more to the, more to the north uh, of white area, so low poverty. It becomes very, very high in the south, southeast, uh, and part of the southwest as well. It's more an issue north versus south rather than uh, rather than uh, east versus west here. And uh, similarly, 
the not working ratio. The not working ratio is an indicator that the, the paper by Austin, Glazer and Summer so that I mentioned at the beginning uses quite a bit. This is the ratio of people that don't work either because they are unemployed, registered unemployed, or because they are not registered unemployed, but they stay home. Maybe discouraged uh, workers or people that simply stay at home and work at home uh, as a ratio of the working age population. So this is considered as an indicator of economic performance by a number of uh, studies. And as you can see, the not working ratio uh, is particularly high. So dark regions uh, in the south, southwest, and also, also uh, to a large extent uh, in the rich regions of the west, California, Northern California, the, the whole west coast uh, is quite dark. So that's, uh, to me, surprisingly so, but maybe, maybe that hides something else. But anyway, so this is, uh, this, is the not, uh, this is the not working ratio. But as I said, so if one looks at the charts, uh, one is tempted to, you know, to make big statements about visual correspondence. But uh, the whole essence of the study we want to do is, is go locally and see how the little geographical units uh, drive this relationship. And this is what we do in the panel estimates. Now, let me say that these panels are really uh, preliminary uh, at this stage. So really Mickey Mouse uh, models uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, as I mentioned, we only have six years. Uh, so the time dimension is not only short, but not even continuous. Uh, there are jumps in the middle. So we have to put uh, ear dummies. We do put the ear dummy, which are interesting in themselves, by the way. I mean, so the ear dummies, for example, the 2010 ear dummy is very large and very significant post-crisis of big unemployment, etc. The dummy uh, takes that out. Uh, so we have the ear dummies. Uh, we consider only three banking variables and three economic variables in this very simple. So the three banking variables are the share of community banks, the return on asset, and the non-performing loans or non-performing assets rather uh, ratio as a total as a total of assets. And the three economic variables are the unemployment rate, the column, the left side column, the poverty rate, the central column, and the non-working ratio, the right uh, hand side column. And we consider the three banking variables first in isolation, one at a time, and then all three together for each of the economic uh, variables. And uh, we have no other controls. We have no other controls. So obviously, I mean, uh, economic performance is not driven only by banks. And this is pretty obvious. And uh, so we should have to, to have a good sense of the coefficient. We should have the controls, which I haven't put them in. This thing is cured to some extent by the fact that we estimate these panels with fixed effects, so fixed effects take away the heterogeneity at the county level uh, because it puts dummies at the county level. So this, in a sense, cures for the fact that there are no explanatory variables that are specific to counties, but not perfectly. Um, and uh, let's see a little bit the, the coefficient. So I don't, I don't know if you can see, can you, I hope you can see my, my pointer here. So let's um, look at, for example, at the effect of uh, non-performing ra uh, assets ratio, the effect on unemployment, or rather, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say effect because it's not causal, but the correspondence between non-performing assets ratios and the unemployment. You see the coefficient here is 0 0.340, the three stars, means that it is significant at 0.1%. Uh, so 
one over a thousand. So this is a very strong significance. We, we think that given the, the very preliminary estimates, we think we should consider only very, very strong coefficients. So we only look at the three stars <coughs> in, the, in the column, the fourth column in which we uh, include all three variables together. So this 3.340, uh, 0 0.340, if we interpret this coefficient, and I'm moving to the next slide, so this means that one standard deviation increase in the NPL ratio of banks, let's say moving from the mean, which is 0 0.7 to 1.3, one standard deviation increase in NPL is associated with an increase in unemployment of 0.2% which means about 500,000 people. So this half a million people, uh, keep in mind that uh, total unemployment in the US is about 10 million. So this is 5%. This is very large. This is too large in my view, uh, because uh, as I said, I mean, it's not very plausible that uh, only the increase of NPL ratios of banks of one standard deviation, everything else, being constant increases um, unemployment by 500,000. The sign is right. The sign is what we would expect. So healthier banks, stronger banks, or in this case, weaker banks, because when the NPL increases, weaker banks increase unemployment. So the sign is right. All the signs are right in the table, but the coefficients are very large. And the same is true if we look, for example, the non-working ratio effect, this coefficient here, we translate it into number of people, <coughs> we get the fact that an increase of the NPL ratio of the same size, so one standard deviation, brings up the number of non-working people by about 420,000. It's very large, it's very large uh, number. Uh, although the number of non-working people in the US is very large, is uh, the order of 35 million, but, but this is, these are very large numbers. It's quite natural that this number is large. It's encouraging that the coefficient is what one would expect, uh, uh, but it's quite natural because there is reverse causation. There's obvious reverse causation. I mean, the performance of the economy drives the quality of the banks. Uh, as well as the quality of the banks drives the performance of the economy. So we have the two effects here, and we need to do an, uh, an exogeneity and endogeneity analysis using instrumental variables and so on in order to disentangle the two. So let's not trust this coefficient except for the fact that they go exactly in the direction we would expect and uh, that they are very significant. Now, uh, the, other thing, the other thing I want to show you is the share of community banks. Now, what is interesting here, when the variables are put all together, the share of community banks disappears. It's no longer significant in any of the three specifications. So this is a bit surprising. I mean, if one believes the, you know, the visual messages from the charts uh, that uh, what uh, comes out here is that the presence of community banks does not affect oh, other things being equal. In particular, keeping equal the performance of the bank, the uh, return on assets and the non-performing, etc. And all the dummies that are there, once all these things are taken in, the community banks disappear. So, uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, an interesting result that calls for deeper analysis, calls for deeper analysis to see, but, uh, but um, I think this is quite uh, suggestive that one should not trust, you know, quick statement based on simple correspondences. Let me uh, then at this point uh, conclude. Uh, now we have lots of uh, data. We believe that these data are very interesting. Uh, they are largely unexploited. They are uh, estimated data. They are not uh, pure statistics. They contain an element of estimates, but the story that they tell 
is very interesting, uh, we found. It's very interesting. And although there may be imprecisions inherent in the estimation method that we use, I think that the law of large numbers works for us. Uh, that there may be small errors here and there in the results of our estimates, but the picture, the general picture that emerges uh, is an interesting one. There's obviously still a lot of work to do because first of all, we have to complete the time dimensions, so lots of work on the data still. Then we have to, we have to work on the panels much more than we have done so far. I think we can already conclude that there is a clear association at the local level between banking conditions and economic conditions. And it's clear that stronger banks are associated with better economic conditions. The causality can go both ways. We cannot make any inference on that. And so one of the urgent next steps is precisely to look at the exogeneity issues and to introduce instrumental variables in a proper way. And you know, we found also interesting and suggested that we found no relationship between local economic conditions and the intensity of presence of, uh, of community banks. I think I would close at this, uh, Scott, and uh, maybe if there are some questions or comments, uh, get them. Thank you very much, Ignacio. That was a great presentation and a really interesting analysis. Uh, I want to remind our um, attendees to please go ahead and type in their questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We do have a number of questions already. So um, first one up is from Thomas B, who comments, uh, very interesting analysis. Based on this information, to me, it looks like an easy step to take uh, this information down to the zip code level. Would there be any advantages to an analysis at this more disaggregate level? Shall I go ahead uh, and answer each, uh, Scott? Yeah, yeah. well, uh, please go ahead and address that question, um, or if you'd like to uh, pass, so we can uh, move on to the next one. No, I can, I can say, let me ask, first of all, am I going to be able afterwards to see the question which have been asked? Because I would like to... Yes. They remain on, uh, they remain on the in the computer, so to speak, so I can we look at them. be able to capture them, or, or Victoria uh, should be able to uh, copy would be important, so I can think about it a little bit more. Yeah. Right, so no, yes, the zip code. The zip code is possible uh, using the same methodology. Uh, it's possible for the banks. It would not be possible, as far as I know the, st the real sector statistics, I, 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 I'm pretty sure that lots of economic and social indicators would not be available at that level. So we have to strike a balance between what is available on the economic side and what we can construct on the banking side. But uh, from the banking point of view, certainly possible, although our assumptions regarding the reliability of deposits as an indicator of location perhaps would be even less valid in that particular case. Great, thank you. From Elena Tang, why do you think the data for, for, the, for big five banks county presence is so skewed? Well, we know that, right? I mean, we, uh, even if we don't trust our allocation methodology, so to speak. We know, we've seen from the, the, the mere presence of, uh, of uh, you're asking why, you're asking why the, it's so skewed. <laughs> because probably because it's not profitable for those mega banks to operate in certain territories. I mean, they, you know, it's costly to go there, it's costly to establish their presence, they make much more money you know, doing uh, merger and acquisitions in New York than uh, doing the small loans in uh, Arkansas. So that's why, that's why they stay in the places where they can make the big bucks. That, that would be my interpretation. The evidence is clear. Thank you. From uh, our colleague, Jeff Fuhr, uh, better to look at the change in unemployment by county versus community bank intensity. This would capture the notion of community banks insulating regions from disruptions. Prevailing unemployment rate will depend on lots of other factors, 
including demographic composition of county, which varies a lot by county. Uh, that's just a comment based on your chart, uh, not on the regressions. Absolutely true, Jeff. Uh, the problem is that we don't have uh, we, 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 the, the time dimension is discontinuous, as you saw. Uh, so we refrain from any dynamics. We left all dynamics out and we put fixed effect. But certainly one of the, one of the things that one needs to do going forward, building proper panels, is to look at dynamics and to look at changes. Uh, I agree with you. That's one of the next steps. Thank you. Um, we have a question. Could the fixed effects be soaking up the effects of community banks? Uh, it does. It's, it's intended to do that. Uh, uh, the effects of community banks, it, it, uh, it, it, uh, it nets out uh, the unobserved variation across community banks, which may be caused by other variables. So that's, the, that's why, that's why uh, I'm, I'm calling on Ch Chantabit now may want to intervene because he's the real expert on these estimates. But um, I, think that, uh, I think that one uh, uh, uses uh, uh, fixed effects precisely to uh, eliminate possible biases uh, coming from the correlation between counties uh, and uh, the regressors which are present. Chantavi, do you want to say something? Sorry. It is possible, but the share of community bank change over time. So it's not totally absorbed by the fake effects. <laughs> yes, I mean, I agree with, um, with the equations, but um, um, from our statistics, um, the share of community bank vary over time. So um, the fake effect doesn't totally absorb that. Okay, we're gonna try, in any case, we're gonna try the following. We've done also the, the pool de OLS, which is the simplest, uh, and we're gonna have to test whether fixed effects or random effects. Once we have a full set of controls, then we have to choose between random effects or fixed effects. And that will be, I think, uh, driven by much more uh, rigorous consideration than we have now. Thank you, Ignacio and Chantuit. Um, as you know, I, I will need to drop off a couple of minutes early, so I'm gonna pose this last question, uh, but the seminar will continue. There are a number of questions still coming. Uh, so depending on how much time Ignacio has available can, can work through those. And, and again, who's going to call the questions after you leave? Uh, are you able to see them on the Q and A? If you call, if you uh, call up the Q and A at the bottom of your screen, you can read through them. The problem is maybe I should take away the slides because with the slides I cannot. Oh no, the Q and A's I can see. Yes, I can yeah, see. Yeah. Can so see I, I'll read this last question and then, uh, unfortunately, I have to drop off. But as I said, you can continue. <clears throat> okay. And work your way through. So uh, another question from our colleague Jeff Fewer. Uh, correlations are impressive, obviously need independent variables or equivalent to get at causality. What instruments do you have in mind? Instrumental variables. We, I don't know if Chantavit has already reflected on that. I have not thought about the instruments yet. Chantavit, do you, do you have something to say to that? You are on mute. Sorry, you are on, on mute. You know, I think I agree. I think this is going to be the one um, big step in, in our future work in order to find the instrument variable that, that will help, um, that will help um, identify more exogenous changes to, in policy that I think one, one person has already recommended in the Q&A. Um, yes, I, I think this is the one, one line of work that we, we will pursue in the future. Okay, the next, if I read well, the next question is, uh, uh, the next question is how does online banking and virtual banking impact or shift these numbers and conclusions? Uh, we don't know. Uh, it would be interesting to think about your question when looking at uh, how the distributions evolve over time and, and how they move uh, 
uh, also geographically. So this is something that, uh, let me write down this question as one of the things that we're going to have to look at as we move to more uh, realistic empirical analysis. And let me move on. Those indicators and more are available at the zip code level. Uh, you mean the deposits? The deposits are available at the zip code level, but not uh, the other balance sheet indicators as far as I am aware. Um, let me move on. Mike Gibson. Hi, Ignazio. Interesting presentation. Have you considered using historical legal constraints on branch banking as an instrumental variable for the share of community banks? Uh, that's part of the next chapter on uh, instruments. Uh, I don't know how much variation, I'll have to study that carefully historically because I don't know how much variation there was in the 2000s. I mean, a lot of those legal changes have taken place uh, earlier, uh, if my recollection is right. But I'll, that's certainly one of the, that's certainly one of the um, instruments that one can use uh, going forward. Ben Friedman, perhaps the reason the community bank share doesn't matter is the Community Reinvestment Act. Yeah, the lack of support for local economic development by branches out of state banks, once interstate banking became legal, was what the CRA was meant to correct. All right. All right, that's, uh, that's an interesting interpretation. Let, let me look into that. Uh, that's a good suggestion. Let me look into that uh, more deeply, actually studying the different uh, legal steps that have been made in order to, to check on that. Based on the analysis, uh, what is your opinion on bank consolidation on economic growth? Uh, based on this analysis, no opinion. Uh, I mean, there are, of course, uh, lots of ideas about uh, how consolidation affects economic perf banking performance, et cetera, lending performance, and so on. There's a big literature on that. But I would say at the present stage of our research now, we cannot draw any conclusion about uh, the consolidation. So let me keep that for future reflection. Thanks for the seminar. Nice presentation, Jeff Frank. And that's it. I think I'm done. I'm done with the questions. So the only thing I can do is thank everybody for attending. Thanks a lot for all the good questions and comments, which we will consider in detail. And have a nice weekend, all of you.